Warren Fadley. I'm a professional photographer who specializes in videotaping and photographing severe storms, such as this violent Texas storm which just produced a tornado about 30 minutes ago. Taking good photographs of lightning is not an easy task. Warren Fadley's lightning photographs are not only good, they're among the best ever taken. In general, Warren still and video work effectively captures what storm chasing is all about. Well, I'm a professional storm chaser, and what I do is I go out and forecast and intercept all kinds of weather, uh, mostly severe weather, uh, chase tornadoes, lightning, hurricanes uh, all across the country, and record the events on film, video, and uh, motion picture film. And then, of course, those, uh, those uh, materials are marketed all over the world for editorial and commercial purposes. Tornado has just crossed the path of my car just in front of me. We do have uh, damage, heavy damage to the area. Tornado is still on the ground over that area. I chase storms for many reasons. It's adventurous, it's exciting, and it's a, it's a challenge that's really unparalleled to anything else I've ever found. We have emergency units rolling directly in front of my vehicle now. Tornado still on the ground over there behind the rain. No storm is the same. Whenever I go out, I never know what I'm going to see it. Large tornado still on the ground. Tornado just a couple miles away now. This is the same tornado that just went through the town. When I'm heading towards a storm, when I'm chasing it, my one objective is to get as close as possible, do it in a safe manner, and set up my equipment to take photographs and film of the storm. And of course, that's not always easy. 446, tornado number two coming down. Well, this was a monstrous storm to begin with. It was a very large supercell, and this family of, of storms had already produced uh, several tornadoes that day, so I knew it was a potentially dangerous storm. Okay, I've stopped the car to give a good look at this storm. This thing has produced at least two or three tornadoes since I've been watching it. As we look over towards the north, back over towards the northwest. Sometimes it's easy to be mesmerized and get carried away. And that's what I did on this day. I spent too much time on the hill looking at this storm, and by the time I made my decision to exit from it, it was almost too late. East over towards the northwest. Well, tornado on the ground, behind the chase vehicle. Extreme wind. Circulation on the ground. It was quite frightening because at that time I was thinking that the tornado was actually forming right above me. And it may have been, but I think what I experienced in the car was the winds that were beginning to circulate on the ground. Uh, some of my best papers just flew out the window. I'm going to have to go back there. This is the area just a few minutes ago where I was escaping from. And as you can see, there is debris on the ground. Uh, there probably was a tornado on the ground behind me. It's a good thing I did make the exit I did. Probably above the car. Or make that a funnel cloud. I don't know if the guy down the road sees it or not. I'm pointing up now and warning him as I'm backing out of here. It is directly overhead. Directly overhead. You had a final cloud right above you. You had a pretty good final cloud right above you. It's gone now. I tried to honk the horn and, and let you know. Well, there are six types of storm chasers. Uh, there are the media storm chasers, like weather people who go out and, and chase storms and report. There are uh, scientific chasers who do research during certain times of the year, go out and actually chase storms. Uh, there are spotters who go out and spot storms for uh, communities and report that back to the Weather Service. Uh, there are uh, hobbyists, which are the largest group of chasers, are hobbyists. Some of them are professionals. Uh, they have professional occupations and they chase as a hobby. There's the dreaded uh, yahoos or the uh, thrill-seeking type of chasers. And there's also uh, what I do as a, as a profession. I actually chase storms for a living. So people chase for many reasons and, and some of them chase for more than one reason. Uh, but most people that chase have some purpose out there for what they're doing. My earliest chase adventure had to be riding my bicycle into dust devils. Well, a dust devil, is a, it looks like a miniature tornado. It's made up of dust and debris, and you see them a lot in the southwest spinning across the highways or in, in vacant lots or through the desert. 
don't remember the exact reason for doing it at the time. I guess maybe it was just the chasing that was in my blood, but a group of kids and myself decided we would take our little spider bikes and try to ride into the center of a dust devil. And a couple guys tried it and they weren't too successful, so finally I just happened to luck out and rode right into the center of a very large dust devil and was inside of it looking around. I couldn't believe what I saw. It was, it was amazing. The, the heat is the number one thing I remember. It was just so hot there you could barely breathe. It, you know, I guess you could say it was like a blast furnace. There was debris spinning around me and it was a weird orange color, I guess, from the light filtering in through the walls of the dust. And when I looked up, I could see a long snaky tube going up into the sky. And it was very impressive. Well, when I got out of the dust devil, my friends all came up to me because they, they lost track of me for quite a while. And they, I imagine they thought, oh boy, the Fadley boy has been lifted away to, you know, the land of Oz or something. Uh, but I was covered with dust and stickers and... Uh, it was, it was a memorable moment. There's no doubt one of my, one of my earliest uh, uh, chase successes. Gust front is a very ominous looking cloud, a very low hanging cloud that, that precedes the storm. Sure I, want to drive uh, I don't think we have any choice. We're very fast moving microbursts. That's, that's probably. Man, look at that thing move. <laughs> Unbelievable. Turn the sky black. Oh, Gust NATO. See it going on the front there? There it is. Going Gust NATO. See it going right well and right on the front. This thing was so strong, it had so much momentum and so much energy that it was just to the point where it was about ready to start ripping things apart. We thought, well, we'll just drive down the road and let it you know, go across the road in front of us and, and shoot some video. But we didn't realize until it was too late that this thing was very strong. Uh, these winds are like, you know, they blow us off the road. We want to turn in front of the car and then the winds. God. No, it's black. Right at zero visibility up here, too. I think we're in it. Well, hopefully this building over here won't come apart on this. Slow down, man. You got to stop. We're going to have an invisibility. We'll go on beyond this debris here in case this building comes apart. It's one of those situations where you're, you're you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't, but you have to drive through the thing. A little bit more as far as we can go. Yeah, we can Get away from the building there. We had no choice. We just had to cross our fingers and let it cross our path. Look at that out there. It looks like the end of the world. Uh. The first thing I shot as a journalist was I specialized in, in any kind of disaster, anything that was dangerous. And I don't think it was so much the danger I enjoyed, I don't have a death wish. I think it was the challenge of getting the photograph, coming back with a great photograph under the worst imaginable conditions. That was what is, is still what attracts me to it. My very first tornado chase in 1987. Uh, I ended up in a town in West Texas that had been completely destroyed by a tornado. Being there firsthand, experiencing it was very humbling and I knew from that point on that what I was going to pursue had a dark side in addition to the beautiful photographs. Storms could be also very tragic. The first time I was called a storm chaser was when Life Magazine published a photograph of mine. Uh, in 1989 and they called me uh, storm chasing uh, storm chaser or storm chasing photographer or something like that. The photograph that appeared in Life magazine was of a lightning bolt hitting a light pole in an oil and gasoline storage facility in Tucson and that photograph launched my career. So it's amazing how just one little thing like that can turn your life around. And there's just something different about the really dangerous, severe storms. They have a certain feel or a certain charisma that's really hard to put in words. The conditions are just that extreme to where you, you know you're going to see something. This was a very frightening storm. We chased it from eastern Colorado into southwest Kansas, and uh, it became clear right off that this storm was going to be one of the monsters. It was going to be a very dangerous storm. Once it got going, it's, it's one of those storms that just, just no way to stop. Small 
problem here. We have a possible tornado forming, which uh, has just been warned by Dodge City Doppler radar as we're heading south, directly in our path. We also have a large hell shaft reported. Very large hell in this area. We were maneuvering to get in front of the storm and go around to the southwest side. But the storm made that turn. It made that right turn right into us. And we had no choice. We couldn't go back because the storm had closed in behind us. We couldn't go to the east because those farm roads were turning into mud. The only choice we had was to go straight forward south where we could see the sun in the distance. The problem was we knew there was large hell just to the west of us and we also knew there was a tornado. So at this point we were trapped. We had no choice but just to go straight forward and hope for the best. I uh, have a hell shaft directly to the west of it between us and the tornado. We're trying to cut in front of it. Uh, unfortunately, the storm appears to have become a right mover. Uh, at this time, do have small marble and pea-sized hell on the road. Tom, just be careful up here. Uh, tennis ball-sized hell in the road, some possibly larger. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't hit anything yet. We could Dr. see the hailstones were getting larger as, as we went further south. They went from pea size to marble to golf ball, and then they were tangerine. Hell now hitting the car, uh, possible baseball size hell. One hit to the head. Ah, we just lost the front windshield. Tom, do you see? Okay, front windshield gone. Uh, another strike from the roof, possible rear, rear window gone. I'm just driving straight through. That's zero visibility through the front. Hell has stopped. Some marble and pea size still hitting the truck. When you have baseball, softball, softball, hellstone hitting you, it's frightening. I mean, there's, there's just no other word to put it. It is, it is the mo probably the most frightening moment I can remember in chasing. Uh, you're completely at the mercy of the hell. There's no way to defeat it. You, you know, if there's no shelter you can drive under, uh, you're, it's there. I mean, there's nothing you can do about it. It's like flak. It's just going to hit wherever it wants. Uh, and you don't know where it's going to hit. It may come through the windshield. Well, the hell broke out the front windshield and also one of the back panel windows. And as a matter of fact, the hell that hit the front windshield could not have picked a better place, at least for the uh, video camera. It hit right in the center where the lens was. And on the video, you notice one moment you can see that it kind of a kind of a sick-looking sky and rain and hell falling, and then bam! The next thing you know, uh, the window shatters. And so that. That was a, a great perspective for the camera. Of course, if you were in the truck, it, it wasn't quite as exciting at the time it happened. I have something that you might enjoy looking at here. Whenever I chase, I always try to find little souvenirs. And this is one of my favorites from West Texas. Caught my pet hellstone. And, uh, a farmer drove by with a cooler full of these and, and gave us some of them. This, this was actually, this is about 50% of its original size, but you can just imagine uh, the headache this would give you if it hit you in the head. But it's, it's kind of a fun thing. It's even got little pieces of, uh, of dirt ingrained into it. But it's, it makes a nice conversation piece. It's not uncommon during a chase season to drive, say, between 10 and, and 20,000 miles and just in the Tornado Alley. Tornado Alley is special because it is within this area that the ingredients which can cause a tornado come together most often. And of course, the western portions of the alley, the, the area I call the hot zone, is unique because of the landscape. Unlike the eastern portions, it's flat and you can see forever. And of course, if you're a chaser, that's important for two reasons. One is you can see tornadoes and chase them. And the second for me is because you can photograph them without the trees and the hills that you have in the eastern areas. There is a special beauty to the plains that most people, I think, miss, and that can be something very subtle. The, the little towns that you drive through that look like they haven't changed in, in 50 years. You have what look like oceans, uh, flowing green oceans of wheat fields, and when you contrast these beautiful white clouds with these, it's, 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 the contrast, at least for me as a photographer, is, is amazing. Sometimes it's mind-boggling, and it's, it's ever-changing. That's one of the things I like about it, too. You, you never have two days where the clouds are the same or the, or the landscapes are the same. It's, it's sometimes just, just breathtakingly beautiful. 
Well, a successful chase day to me is not always uh, landing the ultimate tornado or the ultimate lightning bolt or the ultimate storm cloud. Uh, that generally doesn't happen. Uh, it's all the little things you see, the people you meet, uh, the little towns you drive through. Uh, all these things, no matter how many times you see them, is really what makes up chasing. And you meet other chasers along the way and you, you, you share stories. Uh, these are the things I cherish. It's not just the storm clouds. It's not just the uh, ultimate tornado shot. Uh, it's the interaction with other chasers. It's the people, again, you meet. Uh, so many characters uh, that'll come up to you in a little restaurant and tell you a story about the tornado that passed, you know, in 1942. And, and these are the things that make up chasing. The people, uh, the places, the sights, the smells, the sounds uh, that you experience. It's not just the storms because you're not going to have storms every day. Well, I remember two or three days in advance of the storm day, people were telling me this was going to be the big day. Even that day, the forecast that was being issued said the possibility of large and damaging tornadoes. And that does not happen very often, where you have something that indicates that kind of severe weather may occur. This is a potentially dangerous weather situation for much of Oklahoma. Extreme instability and the expected winds aloft indicate the potential for a significant severe weather outbreak later today, including the possibility of very once the storms go up, you have to rely on visual experience. Probably the, the number one thing that chasers look for are when the first towers go up, these, these solid white cloud masses. You want to see the structure. You, are, are they leaning in the right direction? How are they structured? Are, are they very solid? Are they frayed? Are they, are they very mushy? Uh, and that sounds kind of funny, but that's very important because an experienced chaser can tell from those towers alone what a storm is likely to do if it forms and, and, and if it will be severe in nature. First towers went up about an hour and a half ago. This is the first one I can see that has some real structure to it. 636, very large tornado still on the ground. This was the first tornado that I actually photographed, that I actually had on videotape or film. I had seen tornadoes before, but either from a distance or they weren't in a position where I could photograph them. So this was unique because this was the first up-close personal tornado opportunity I'd ever had. Tornado is now wet. Large wedge on the ground. Very large vortex. The thing that amazed me about this storm was the tornado was so big, and I believe this thing was almost a mile wide at one point. We're going to have to stop here. It's going to be crossing the road. I mean, if you go back and look at the videotape, it almost looks like a, a cloud of smoke on the ground. It doesn't look like your typical funnel that, that we all associate with a tornado. It was so big, it looked like smoke. And I, I can imagine somebody at a distance looking at this would never have figured this was a tornado. They would have thought that it's a dust cloud or something like that. Course is going crazy over the gigantic wedge. Alright, less than a mile down the street now. Okay, it's going to be crossing the road now. There were several supercells that day which produced a very, very violent tornadoes. The one I saw, if I remember right, didn't kill anyone, which was very fortunate considering the size of the tornado. Of course, the one in Wichita killed many people. But that's one of the things when you chase, you never know of where that tornado is going to go. I mean, I've sat and looked at maps and tried to plot a course of a tornado, where it's going to go. And sometimes you're, you get a knot in your stomach because you realize that tornado is heading towards a community. And then other times it'll skip right in and out of a heavy populated area. So it's kind of a roll of the dice. Very large tornado, unfortunately, appears to be going through a populated area now. As a chaser, I never forget that that tornado's on the ground, and if you see debris go up or something else, you wonder, you know, is that, is that someone dying there or someone's home being destroyed? It's, it's a very uncomfortable feeling. It, one side of you is very excited because you're witnessing this amazing spectacle, and then the other side of you, there's a knot in your stomach saying, you know, people could be dying as you're watching this thing, and you, you have to remember that as a chaser. Tornado less than one mile away, large wedge on the ground. Got to stop here pretty soon. We do have debris falling in the area.
video, the height video shot of the year. I think lightning storms are probably one of the most dangerous storms to chase. With a tornadic storm, if there's a tornado on the ground, you can usually track it and stay away from it. It's your choice how close you want to get. With a hurricane, you know days in advance it's coming. You can watch television and radar reports. The problem with lightning is, is there's nothing you can do to really forecast it. Lightning makes up its own mind where it's going to hit. And it can be, you know, the top of your head or your tripod. That's what makes it so dangerous. It gives very few secrets of its intentions before it actually hits. You, you may feel your hair stand on end, or, or as happened to me one time, my, my tripod actually became electrified. It's not uncommon for lightning to leap out the back of a storm or the sides uh, maybe 10 or 15 miles away from the storm. That, that's not real common, but it does happen. So you have to remember, usually if you're close enough to a storm to hear thunder or see the lightning, you're in danger. And of course, really anytime you're near a storm of any kind, it's, it's dangerous. But especially if the storm's generating lightning, uh, it's, it's safe not to second guess it. I don't recommend anyone going out and trying to shoot lightning again unless you have the experience or you can do it in a manner that's, that's safe. Well, what I like about lightning is, is it's like a snowflake. No two lightning bolts are the same. I can go through my files and look at thousands of photographs, and although you have some photos that are similar, you never have the same lightning bolt. It's like a fingerprint where you'll have one little strange little curly branch here, or you'll have maybe a dual branch or several branches or a single branch. It's always different. That's what's so amazing about it. You just never know what you're going to capture on film. And sometimes when you're watching it, when you're shooting it, what comes out on film is entirely different. And it's, sometimes it's astonishing when you actually have the film in your hand after you've shot it. Some of the things you see can be, can be absolutely breathtaking. I think the best lightning photographs come at the end of the day, right before it gets dark, when you have what we call beauty light. And there's just a little bit of existing light left and you're able to balance that light with the lightning, whether it's sunset or, or just a little touch of light on the city. To me, that is the best light for lightning. A lot of people will ask me, what's the secret to shooting lightning? And there really is no secret because the exposures, the, the, the film speed, the, the shutter openings, all these things can vary greatly because of uh, existing light or the, uh, the type of lightning and your, your proximity to it and uh, some other factors too. Whenever I go shoot lightning on one of the popular hilltops near Tucson, there's always hundreds of people. It's, it's like the fireworks show, and I think a lot of people like to watch lightning for that reason. It is kind of like nature's fireworks. I think people are fascinated by it. What, what amazes me, even to this day, after shooting lightning for well over 10 years, is that you're capturing something that would otherwise be lost forever. You'll see a great lightning bolt hit in front of you, and if there's people watching, you'll hear all the oohs, ahs, oh, that's amazing, and you know, people lose their minds, and it's just it's so gorgeous. And I'm thinking, wow, I've got that on film. I have captured something powerful and elusive, and I have literally embalmed it on film. And I think there's something about that, and I don't really know how to put it in words, but there's something about capturing something that's so elusive, so fast, so powerful, and once you've got it on film, it's, it's there forever. When I first started shooting lightning on video, one of the things I would do when I came home, a matter of fact, I would sometimes stay out shooting lightning till 11 or 12 at night, and I'd come in and stay up till 3 or 4 in the morning, going back over every single lightning bolt and slowing it down in slow motion and watching it. And sometimes you see amazing things. It was fascinating. When we first started chasing, we would either use rental cars or our own cars. And one of the cars we used was uh, Tom, my chase partner's old police sedan, which we called the Blues Brothers car. I remember one time we were chasing uh, near Lubbock, and the tires were so coated with mud they became like balloons caked with mud, and the, and the car wouldn't move. And finally, Tom had to get out with a butcher knife and, and literally slice the mud off the tires. And uh, at the same time, of course, we were being eaten alive by Texas size uh, mosquitoes. That's the way it works. At the end of the 1992 chase season, I decided that I, f I would need some type of vehicle designed just for chasing. The rental cars, the personal cars just weren't working out. Uh, they were okay, but I needed something with four-wheel drive, I needed something with more room, and, and mainly something designed just for chasing, something to hold all the communications equipment, all the computers, uh, all the other electronic equipment that we were suddenly 
uh, beginning to, to use in our chasing endeavors, we, we needed a vehicle uh, made just for chasing, and that's when I decided to design the uh, Shadow Chaser. Right now we're working night and day. It's March 23rd to get the truck ready for storm chase season. We've got roughly a little less than a month before we have to be on the road. When I first started putting the Shadow Chase together, I thought, oh, this is going to be a cinch. We'll just throw us equipment in and that'll be it. We'll be chasing. Well, little did I know that all the equipment that went in had to be engineered into this truck. It had to be designed so it was easy to use. You could pull it out. It had to have backup. It had to have redundancy systems in case something failed. And it became a very complex engineering problem, which took a lot longer than I had originally planned. Well, this is the interior of the Shadow Chaser. And all this equipment in here serves a specific function when we're chasing, and some of it's for safety reasons and some of it's for relaying information. One of the most important pieces of equipment we have on board is the weather computer here. And this little monitor allows us at the touch of a button to get almost any kind of weather data that we can also uh, get through a computer service, uh, such as temperature, uh, wind speeds, dew points, and those types of things as we're actually driving. In front here we have a, a special bracket that's designed for a video camera that allows us to shoot hands-free out the front of the, uh, of the truck here as we're driving. This is connected to a monitor so we can monitor what the camera is seeing. We have three radios and these serve two very important functions. One is for receiving information as we're driving near a storm and also we can uh, transmit data to the National Weather Service or emergency management organizations. Uh, same thing with the cellular phone which is probably the most important uh, piece of communications equipment which allows us to uh, connect in by modem and get uh, computer data through this laptop computer. So all of this equipment has a very specific function as we're, when we're chasing and it's all designed uh, to make chasing both safe and also allows us to relay information. Chasing at night can be very hazardous. There's a few chasers that will go out at night, but I won't. Very, very large hill. On this particular night, there was a tornado warning for the metropolitan Amarillo area, report of a tornado heading into the city. Definitely damaging hell right now. And I got the big idea of, of trying to drive through part of the storm to get into the city to see if I could maybe get a shot of this tornado illuminated by lightning. But after I was on the freeway for just a few minutes, the car started getting hit by hell and I knew I was in trouble. I was afraid it was going to break the windshield, and you know when I look back on it, I'm not so afraid of injury from the hell as much as I would be afraid of being out of a chase for a day. And I think sometimes that's a concern when people say, oh, are you frightened? Uh, hell yeah, I'm frightened of storms, just like everyone else. But at the same time, I'm frightened of not being able to chase the next day. So a lot of times when I get near a hell storm or wind or anything that could damage the vehicle, uh, one of my concerns certainly is that, that we're able to chase the next day. I have to admit, the first time I took the Shadow Chaser out, I was a little intimidated. There were so many bells and whistles and computer screens and, and all these little doodads that it, I thought, wow, this is going to be totally overwhelming. And it took me a year, probably, to, to really get used to knowing where everything was and being able to close my eyes and operate everything. But now, it's, it's second nature. I've spent so much time in it, it's, it's just like you know, walking down the street. So, I think most people don't realize that chasing is about maybe 75, 85 percent a waiting game. It's very boring. It's not out there. You're not you know, driving down the road with your hair on fire uh, chasing uh, wild storms. Uh, most of it's uh, sitting on the side of the road under a shade tree uh, staring at the sky hoping something goes up. And that's really the essence of chasing. It's not all excitement. A very, very small portion of it's the, the real exciting part that you, that you see. For those of you who have never chased storms in uh, West Texas, there is a uh, new device which the state has just put into use. It's the anti-chase uh, truck and it deploys dirt directly in front of your chase vehicle when you're driving, so you have to maintain a safe speed. It's worked pretty good so far and has certainly uh, reduced my ability to intercept the storms which are in front of me. Again. This is the new uh, Texas Highway Department Dirt One unit, which deploys loose sand in front of chase vehicles, preventing them from driving at high speeds toward storms. Four tornadoes on the ground, four. There's a very large stovepipe to the left, 
a funnel dissipating in the middle and to the right there's another stovepipe forming into the back. There's a smaller funnel, but the one, the one tornado which I'm becoming uh, closer to by the second is very, very large. When you're chasing, you really never know what you're going to see. If you see a tornado, you're happy. That, that's a rare event, relatively speaking. But to see four or five tornadoes on the ground at once, if someone told me on this morning you're going to see you know, four or five tornadoes on the ground at once, I would laugh and say, yeah, right. But there I was. I turned the corner, looked to the south, and there they were. There was one large tornado near the body of the storm, and to the uh, southwest of, those, of, the, of the main tornado, uh, there were three or four weak tornadoes, or, or what's commonly referred to as land spouts, forming on the back of this cloud. I could not believe it. And as I drove toward it, one would form, one would dissipate. One would form, one would dissipate. And it was just, it was like watching uh, something out of a nightmare or something. You, you could not believe that you were physically witnessing some event like this, which is relatively rare. Yeah, I've got to get a shot of this before these things broke out. I think one of the hardest decisions to make as a chaser is when to stop and shoot. That's always a problem because you always know in the back of your mind that most tornadoes last less than 10 minutes. And so there's this clock ticking inside, the kind of a countdown clock once you see a tornado and it's saying, okay, this tornado is not going to be on the ground long. Where's Al Unser when you need him? And I don't know how many times I've made the mistake of watching a tornado on the ground and saying to myself, oh, well, Warren, you can get closer to that and get a better shot and it dissipates. They can dissipate in a second. It's amazing. One of the problems is always deciding when to get out of the truck and shoot. And fortunately, when these tornadoes were on the ground, I made probably the best decision. Once the last tornado in the back was forming, I decided to stop the truck and shoot. And now I look back, that was probably the exact time I should have stopped. So I was very fortunate. When I got back to the hotel that night and looked at the footage, the first thing that went through my mind was the feeling of, oh man, I would have given anything to just been a half a mile closer. But that's wishful thinking. The art of storm chasing and photography involves two distinct windows. One is the artistic window, which is getting smaller as you get closer to the storm and the daylight fades. And the other window is the window of safety. And the secret to this profession is balancing those two windows, getting the photographs and staying alive. The ideal lighting conditions for any kind of storm is to have some type of sunlight on the elements and whether it's a tornado or whether it's a wall cloud or hail or anything else you're shooting, sunlight's critical. You have to position yourself into a favorable position where you think that light will be because you may have other storms going up and blocking the light or you may have a lot of haze or humidity in the air. So light is really, as it is in any photography, is really the secret. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Punch is big. Let's get close to these good shots. I'd say about now. This is good. Green grass, white, white keep funnel. Going, keep going. We're gonna miss it. Keep going. You're gonna miss it. Let's go over. Keep going.
Tom Willett's my chase partner, and I can't really say enough about the guy. I mean, it's so hard to find good chase partners because you have to have so much in common. Uh, you have to have similar interests. You have to have about the same patience level. Very large tornado. Let's just go for contrast. Let's not even stop. Let's just go. We gotta get stills. We gotta get stills. They probably broke out. The nice thing about Tom is we have this nice balance where, where we balance and check each other. We forged a really good chase partnership over the years. Nine check is 653. Just across the Oklahoma border into the Oklahoma panhandle. The size of the boulders of this road. Just watch for dips or anything else. This tornado, by the way, has been reported at Skywarn frequency, so we're not in the process of now reporting it. Roads are really the lifeblood of a chase, and as I always say, the maps of those roads are the blueprints, so it's very important. Roads make or break most chases. Crossroad, watch. Car clear. I think tornadoes have a beauty of their own. Of course, there's nothing beautiful about a tornado going through a populated area and killing people. But fortunately, most tornadoes occur out over open farmland or fields or, or deserted areas. The sunlight on the side of a tornado at sunset or maybe the white clouds of the storm, you know, wrapping around a dark funnel can be, in its own way, absolutely beautiful. Uh, and on May 5th, uh, this is one of the things we saw. We saw white tornadoes over green fields. We saw what we call dark gray wedges. Uh, we saw long, skinny Wizard of Oz type tornadoes. Uh, it was just a tornado fest, if you excuse the expression. There were just tornadoes of all different shapes and sizes and colors. I will never ever forget that day and the, and the, and the, the tornadoes that I saw, the, the, the shapes and the colors. It, it's just something that I think a chaser dreams of capturing in a single day. When the chase day's over, the first thing a chaser thinks about is lodging. In the late part of May, during the height of the tornado season, sometimes there's a lot of competition for motel rooms. So usually when the chase day's over, the little red light goes off and says, well, we better find a room real quick before they're all gone. And of course, uh, motel rooms uh, in little towns and along the highway can be a real experience in themselves. You know, forget the tornadoes. Uh, some of the best chasing stories involve uh, hotels and motels uh, along the roads. I think chasers are always putting themselves in, in, in the danger zone, if you will, uh, at the end of a chase day. Uh, s storms can erupt uh, further down the line and move in at night, and that's always, always a serious problem, uh, is that the, the hunter is going to become the hunted as the night wears on. And there's more than once uh, I've chased very severe storms uh, in the western uh, area, and then you'll go to sleep in the eastern area and be woke up at night with tornado warnings or large hail hitting the car. Uh, and that's just part of chasing. I, I don't think there's any way you can escape that. Well, it's 12.52, uh, May 25th, 1992. I'm in a motel in Midland, Texas. There's a report of a tornado on the ground in Odessa heading in this direction. Well, I was in Midland, uh, Texas uh, one night after a chase. I was totally exhausted. Uh, it had been a long chase day. There had been numerous tornado warnings. I had had to, to, to drive back and forth over and maybe four or five hundred miles trying to get in, in the position with this storm. Hopefully get another spotter report and be able to find shelter. I looked earlier right after I heard the first report and I can't find a shelter in this vicinity, so I'm probably going to have to, uh, to tough it out. They're now putting it up on the screen. It is a tornado warning uh, for Midland County, a report of a tornado on the ground by the Sheriff's Department. So I'm in this room thinking, well, well what am I going to do here? Where am I going to go find shelter? And this comes at the end of a long chase day, too. I think it's time to go find a shelter and get the hell out of here. 
So as I was contemplating what I was going to do in this room, this lightning bolt hit right outside the room and I jumped. I mean, you talk about that moment of just total fear. I thought for sure it'd come into the room and got me. It was just so loud, so abrupt and bright. Uh, I just about jumped out of my skin. I can smell the ozone. It must have hit either the balcony or right next to my car. I'm glad I didn't go up on the balcony. Chasing requires an immense amount of preparation. It's very important that anyone who chases storms have some knowledge of meteorology and more importantly have some knowledge of the very storms they're chasing. The typical chase day usually begins first thing in the morning when you turn on the television and see what the weather forecast is. Uh, and the reason you do that is you want to have some idea of where the, the severe weather is likely. You have to be able to forecast. You have to be able to look at hourly changes on a weather map and plot it up and decide where you're going to go. All these things are very important, and if you don't know those, you'll be out there wandering around aimlessly. And of course, at the same time, uh, it can be very dangerous if you don't know what you're looking at and know what this storm is capable of producing. It's not a perfect day, but there's an outside chance. 836, have a large tornado on the ground. Get on up the hill here and we'll pull over. Go on up a little bit more, we can get a little bit more contrast on it. Your first tornado, what do you think? Massive! Cool! Groovy! Find the police in the town of here. Why don't we just stop right here? Stop right here. Let's shoot it. The tornado is only about a mile away now. Pretty wild. Come on, Tim! Come now. Make sure you go on the speed limit. That's a photo. That's cool. Warren's forecasting pays off. That is why. Lightning. Did you see that? Lightning in the funnel, around the funnel. One of the greatest moments for me as a chaser was when I got to the point where my forecast started paying off, where I could put on paper uh, a forecast using all this meteorological data and actually pinpoint an area where tornadoes were going to form. And I remember the first time I did that was Laverne, Oklahoma, where I actually got it down to about a 50, maybe 100 square mile area and a tornado actually occurred there. So it's a great feeling to know that you've educated yourself and you've gained the experience where you can be confident enough to forecast tornadoes in a, in a, in a very small target area. I think my best advice for anyone that wants to chase storms is to learn about the storms first. Learn about the dangers of weather, learn about the mechanics of severe weather, and a lot of people that do this will not want to chase. They'll realize that it's a lot of hard work and it's not always seeing tornadoes and, and lightning every day. Uh, which you don't usually see. It. One of the dangers a lot of people don't think about are dust storms. There was no way to avoid this dust storm. It was literally right next to us the whole time we were next to the storm and we knew sooner or later it would, would overcome the truck. So you have two choices, of course you can you know, pull off the roads or, or whatever else the, you're supposed to do, but there were no other vehicles in our area so we decided to slow down and just, just let the dust storm overtake us and continue on. Hurricane Andrew was a storm I had always waited for. There had been other hurricanes before that, but they had all struck land at night, so as a photographer that doesn't do me any good. I needed a hurricane uh, in the daytime that I could photograph, and Hurricane Andrew looked like the storm that was going to do that. I decided to ride Hurricane Andrew out in a parking garage in Coconut Grove, 
in South Florida. I surveyed the coast and decided this was probably the best area because it would offer me access to the coast, which was very important when the hurricane hit. Also, it, it afforded me some shelter from a debris that I expected to come inland from the harbors there. When the hurricane reached its peak that night, the sounds originally were, were sounds of destruction, glass breaking and, and things crushing against things. And it, it's a sound that you can't even really describe, it's just horrific destruction sounds. But at one point, the hurricane winds took over. The sound they were making, the screaming, screeching sound of the winds dominated everything. At the time, I remember referring to it as a sound that of the devil screaming. That was the only thing I could think of that would come to mind, and I will never, ever forget that sound. When I was shooting, I could not believe it. I kept looking around thinking, you know, this is a major news story, and every major news story I'd ever covered before, there were photographers everywhere. So I kept looking around thinking, where in the world are all the other journalists? And there was no one. There was no journalist. There were, there were no emergency uh, rescue people. There was no one. I was the only person out there for quite a while. It was, it was kind of an eerie feeling. Andrew paid off. There was just enough sunlight. I got some absolutely wonderful shots. One of them appeared on the cover of Life magazine. Between the rain and the wind, uh, it's amazing I even got a shot. I mean, the lenses were, were coated with water. One of the cameras failed. Uh, just about everything you could imagine uh, went wrong. Some of the film uh, was destroyed by water. So I was very fortunate uh, that I got what I did. But then when I look back, you know, I, it reminds me of uh, one of my favorite uh, expressions in this business, and that is, luck is the residue of design. And I think that's, that's a classic example of that. Well, I was working on some notes for chasing. I just happened to look out the window, and I saw this real suspicious cloud, and I thought, nah, that can't be. And I went back to writing and, and taking care of my notes, and I kept looking up at this cloud, and I thought, well, you know, this is March in Tucson, you know, there's not going to be any severe weather. But the more I watched this cloud, the more it began to look like something out of Texas, and before long, it had a small funnel cloud forming, and I thought, oh boy. So I ran upstairs, grabbed the camera, started shooting it, started calling my friends, and the next thing I know, the funnel cloud extended down about halfway down to the ground, and then a few moments later, I could see small pieces of debris coming up, and it was an actual tornado on the ground. So it was quite frightening because here I was chasing all these years out in the Midwest and now all of a sudden I was being chased. So I knew what these people feel firsthand when the tornado is out there heading towards them and, and you're actually the one that's in danger instead of uh, being out tracking these things. I think the number one thing when I look back that got me going with this wacky life of mine has to be the Wizard of Oz tornado. Back then, you had to wait for the yearly broadcast, and I remember every year I'd be glued to that television set, and the one part, no matter what was happening, was that when that tornado came on, I was there glued to the television. And even nowadays when I see the tornado, I'm amazed. It looks real. It looks as real as anything I've seen. The tornado I shot near Miami, Texas reminded me a lot of the Wizard of Oz tornado. It just had that dusty, elongated uh, look to it. As a matter of fact, when I was shooting it, my mind was racing over a million things. But just for that one second, I had a little flashback to the Wizard of Oz tornado. Right before I got the shot of the Miami tornado on videotape, I had set up my still camera and took a great panoramic shot of it. And as I was shooting, hail started falling. First it was marble and pea size, and then it went up to, to golf ball size. And it was hitting the back of my head and it was starting to hurt. And I'm thinking, man, I've got to get one shot. And I just sat there, went through a whole roll of film and got one or two great shots. And then the hail got so big I had to leave. And I always think back, you know, that's one of those times where you think, well, what if I just stayed just, you know, a couple more seconds, would I have gotten a better shot? But it ended up I got a great shot and it was worth it. Sometimes you just have to, to give up and let go and that's, that's part of storm chasing.
I think rainbows are kind of a symbol of the calm after the storm. A lot of times after you've chased and the storm has passed by and you realize you can't really go any further with it, to the back of the storm you'll, you'll have the conditions that will form a beautiful rainbow and it's kind of a final signature for the storm and it's kind of a nice way to end the day. For me, chasing is the ultimate adventure. Right now, I'm driving, Tom, navigating. It encompasses moments of awe. It encompasses moments of fright. The unknown, the adventure, the travel, all these things make up chasing. I don't think I'll ever quit chasing storms until I'm physically unable to, or mentally unable to. As long as I can chase storms, I'll be out there. And hell, I thought about it. If I can, I'll probably you know, go out and buy a shack out in the middle of nowhere and just sit there and watch them go by. But uh, I really can't see myself chasing. And I know if I was doing something else in my life, I think I would still have some interest in chasing, either doing it as a hobbyist or, or, or going out and, and watching them from my backyard. But uh, at this point, uh, chasing is as much of me as anything else, and I really don't ever see myself stopping. When I look at the photographs uh, of what I've taken, the, the memories they bring back, uh, it's something you just never forget.